And joining us now, she is uh, the head coach at Oregon State, entering, I believe, is her ninth season uh, at Oregon State. They've been there a little while, of course. Four-time Olympian, three-time gold medalist, is USA Softball as part of the U.S. Softball uh, coaching staff for the 2021 Summer Olympics uh, coming up. It was supposed to be 2020. She's done it all. Speak of uh, Laura Berg, who joins us back here on In the Circle. Welcome back. Thanks for having me back. What has this been like for you and your program here? It's been a unique 2020s. We'll get into, obviously, because it's thrown off. The Olympics got pushed back a year with everything. Uh, but how has it affected your program here this fall? It's a unique fall for everybody. Uh, every coach I've talked to has had to be a little more creative, but yet they've learned some things about your team. How, how was this fall for your, for your program? Yeah, um, you know, we were really very lucky. We didn't have uh, anybody thrown into quarantine. Uh, we got all of our practices in and, you know, we did have to get a little, little creative uh, working in pods, um, not necessarily always, you know, outfillers with outfillers, infillers with infillers. It was more um, roommates, you know, so they can stay in pods. And so if one person got sick, then just that pod would go into quarantine and not have to shut down the whole team. Um, the only really difference was the fall games. We didn't get to get our eight fall games in. Uh, but we got to do some scrimmaging. The weather was great. And so we were out on the field most of the, most of the time during the fall. And so we got to get a lot of scrimmaging in against each other. The roster situation, everybody's dealing with it with the extra year of eligibility that college athletes got in the spring. Uh, there's been some adjustments, some navigating, if you will. Has that been the case for you? How did the, that ruling after the 2020 season got shut down and they, the, the NCAA ruled the extra year, how did that affect your team from this year's roster as well as obviously recruiting standpoint? Yeah, you know, the team that's really going to get affected is going to be next year. We've got like 10 kids coming in uh, during that year. Uh, this year, we only had about four. We had four seniors last, uh, last year. Uh, three of them have come back. And it's actually been kind of a blessing. Um, one of my, my Australian pitcher won't be with us this season because she's trying out for the Olympic team. So she, that's going to, the tryout is in, smack in the middle of our season. Um, so with the quarantine that they would have to do there, the quarantine that she would have to do here, she would miss a big chunk of the season. So she's just going to stay there. And we ended up getting a pitcher back. And so actually it was kind of a blessing for us. That's got to be unique for you. Somebody right there with the Olympics being pushed back a year, dealing with that, knowing what it's like on the other shoe there. So I, I would imagine you're one of the yeah. few people that can relate to that and probably understood it right away. <laughs> oh, absolutely. You know, I had, a, I had a good conversation with Tarney and, you know, I had to red shirt in between my sophomore and junior year uh, so I can meet up with the team in April. And so, you know, I've got, I've got a soft spot in my heart for her and understand what she's trying to do. And I wish her all the luck. I hope she, she makes the team and, you know, I would really love to, to beat her and her teammates in, in Japan. So <laughs> that's funny. That's funny. It'll be, what, a battle, but, um, it'll be fun. That would be fun. Well, uh, what have you learned about your team this fall? Um, and it, what did you learn about yourself uh, as well? Because this, you know, this is, there's no handbook for this. Uh, you're, you know, this is a unique perspective here. So what, what did you learn about your team? What? What, what, did you, what did you also learn about yourself there as far as this fall? Being, maybe some things. Yeah. Yeah. Being prepared for a pandemic. What? <laughs> We're not ready for that? Um, yeah, I never in my, in, in my life would imagine, you know, going through something like this. And, you know, what I'm really, really proud of uh, the players is just their flexibility, you know, their ability to, um, be okay with schedule changes if we needed to do it. Uh, their ability to make adjustments when it comes to, you know, hey guys, I've got to put practice back an hour or we got to move practice up an hour or, you know, what have you. We can't, you know, not everybody can go into the weight room together. We're going to have to split you up or, you know, things like that. They just, they took it on and was just pretty much coach, whatever you give us, we'll do it. And so I was super, super proud of them to be able to do that. Um, also for me, you know, I'm not always the most patient, uh, person and I, uh, tend to kind of react, um, very quickly without getting all of the information. And so that was one thing that, you know, this has really helped me, um, be more patient and, and, and be more relaxed. They really, you know, as an athlete, you learn to control what you can control. And here as a coach, <laughs> I got to control what I can control, you know? Um, if a kid, you know, happens to come down with, 
you know, a simple cold, but because of the pandemic that we're in, they have to stay home for practice, yeah. you know, for a couple of days until they get those symptoms under control and then they can come back. And so there's no use of getting upset about it. You know, it, it is what it is. You have to deal with it. And then the next person, you know, this is the next man up. Okay. So our first baseman is out. So next first baseman, you got to go in and you got to learn the system. So uh, just being, just being more patient is something that, that this thing has really um, challenged me to do, to be. How is the team from a chemistry standpoint? You mentioned you got players back an extra year. You got new faces as well, blending in. How is the chemistry? Who are some of the leaders on this team, you know, especially on the offensive side, uh, as you figure out your offense here for the upcoming season. Yeah, we have a, a great chemistry. Um, you know, they they have done some really creative things of um, going and hiking. You know, as kind of a, a a team get together. You know, you can be outside, you can social distance, you can be in your pods if you wanted to be close to each other. Um, you know, they'll go out to practice early or they'll stay late and they'll circle it up and have conversations, you know, where they can, again, social distance and, and be further apart, but get to really kind of know each other. Um, you know, uh, they just, they've done a really good job and I'm really, really happy and really proud of them. Um, as far as, you know, offensive leaders, you know, obviously Frankie Hamoudi uh, will be in our full four hole. And so she is probably one of the uh, most powerful hitters I've, I've seen in a really long time. Uh, Missy Noons, even Mariah, Mariah Maison, um, who's, you know, one of our uh, primary pitchers, and she's taken on the role of being a hitter. Uh, she was one of our leading hitters last year. And so um, watching her kind of grow, you know, as, a, as an athlete and as a leader has been really fun for the whole coaching staff. Um, you know, Xiao, uh, she is one of our youngest ones on the team. She actually uh, graduated high school early to come uh, here. And, you know, she's, she's done a really good job second base, one of the hardest positions on the field. And uh, she's done a really good job of, of taking the leadership uh, in the infield and, and in, the, in the lineup as well. You mentioned uh, Mariah. Just talk about her and how you've seen the growth in her. She's becoming a, a, such an – we talked about her the last time you were on. What an incredible pitcher. She's a two-way player, old-school player. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's your heart and soul here. What have you seen from her and uh, expect from her? Because she seems to, I know she keeps getting better and better. What areas could mm -hmm. she possibly get better is the scary thing. Um, I would say, you know, sometimes she can kind of stick it in cruise control a little bit uh, when she's on the mound. Um, that kind of, kind of has um, bit her in the butt a little bit. Um, you know, uh, She's cruising along, you know, during a game and then all of a sudden sticks it cruise control and then gives up a home run. And so uh, I would say maintaining that, that uh, uh, mentality, maintaining that, that toughness from the first pitch to the last pitch that she throws, you know, not, not taking a pitch off. Um, but Mariah, you know, she, she wants to be in the lineup. She wants to be able to hit the game winning run in. She wants the ball in her hand when, you know, the game is on the line. She will pick her teammates up, you know, if, if someone is having a bad game or if somebody, you know, isn't all there, she'll get in the middle of them and tell them, hey, you know, we need you. Uh, pull your head out and let's go. Game on, me and you right here. And, uh, you know, she just has, has really done a really good job off the field, uh, getting her teammates to come out and, you know, get extra hitting in or, throw an extra bullpen. She, she, her freshman year would come here and she would get a bullpen in um, during her, her days off in the rain. Uh, she'd pull her teammate out. And uh, it's been really fun to be able to watch her kind of grow from her freshman year to, to what she is now. And, you know, getting last year, kind of getting last year back. And so we have her for another two years. Um, I think last year really was a confidence booster for her knowing that she can hit at this level. Super competitive person, right? Like, I feel like she would be the type that if you didn't put her in the lineup somewhere, she would be upset, right? Is that For fair? sure. For sure. She wants to, I can even, and the great thing with Mariah, she's such an athlete. She did water polo in high school. She's such a strong athlete. I can put her at first base. She's always on me about, hey, coach, I can go play the outfield, you know? And, and so she just, uh, she's a competitor. She, she wants to win. When you brought her in, was that plan always to be a two-way player? Did it just evolve? How did that become? Because you've played her at first. You've deep Peter, her, obviously pitch. 
Uh, what was the plan when she came to campus, when she first arrived, and, and, and how has that evolved? Yeah, I always knew Mariah could, could hit. I remember her coming up for one of our elite camps, and she hit a ball over the scoreboard um, that's in uh, left center. And so uh, we always knew that she had the ability to hit her, her freshman and sophomore years. We really didn't need it in the lineup. Um, but uh, last year, she really took it on and said, hey, I, I want to be in the lineup. I, I can do this. And really, really worked hard at it, put extra time in it, and became, you know, somebody that we really relied on, on hitting uh, runners in. How do you feel about the, the pitching staff behind her uh, going into this season in a season where, you know, you, the sport, as you know, keeps growing. You need more multiple arms, especially in the Pac-12. Yeah, you know, uh, I talked about Xiao Jin. She's our second baseman, but she can also, uh, she can also pitch. And she's, she's one of those kids that is just like, coach, you know, put me anywhere you want, uh, whatever's best for the team. And, and, and that's really fun when you get a player that's like that. Real smooth athlete, and she just – She's not going to throw the ball by you. She's just going to, you know, paint corners. She's going to put the ball where it's supposed to be and get you to swing and miss or roll over it. Um, Tristan, you know, is someone who uh, is a hard worker. She also, she, uh, she transferred here. She's a, a graduate transfer and um, she's done a really good job of, um, you know, coming to a new program and really kind of taking the reins. You know, she, she's a competitor at the mound. You know, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll pick her change up and she'll get really mad and then she'll figure out a way to, to, you know, keep people from being able to do that. And, uh, you know, she's done a, a, a really good job of taking last year and the experiences that she got from last year and sticking it under her belt and continuing on for her, her, uh, her last year. Um, same thing with Narissa Eason. You know, I think she, uh, she's untapped potential, you know, she still has not quite hit her, um, her, uh, her top level just yet. And uh, I, it's going to be scary when she does because she is, is extremely talented, extremely uh, athletic for a pitcher. And, um, you know, she can also hit if I needed to put her in um, as an emergency, she can also play for space. And so, uh, you know, and Narissa pitches, you know, she's in the, she's in the upper 60s to 70s. And so it's just a matter of, um, you know, getting things right between the years. You've always recruited and brought in versatile players that could play multiple positions uh who could be a two-way player even if they're a pitcher talk about mm -hmm. that philosophy is that something you've kind of always had is that something that goes back to the international game because you know we've had Ken Erickson on he talks about versatility is so mm -hmm. pivotal uh and yeah. he and he's kind of used that in his recruiting in college to have versatility because you need that in the Olympics because the Olympics your roster is even smaller people may not realize that yeah than it is in college. Is that where this came from, from your standpoint? Are you kind of in the same boat as far as your philosophy when it comes to that? Oh, for sure. You know, having the ability to play with people like Lisa Fernandez, you know, watching her be this just all American, you know, wall of a third baseman, you know, and, 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 and coming in and, and hitting, you know, she owns a record for batting average uh, in the Olympic games and then the best pitcher in the world, you know, and I think that's, um, that's something that, you know, kind of help that helps the team out and it makes you a, a, a more important person. And that's one thing for these younger kids to, unlock, to realize, don't just limit yourself to one position, make yourself so valuable that you learn to play not just one, two positions and play them very well. And, you know, have that, that knowledge of the game. Um, and it's, it'll be hard. If you hit, you're going to be in the lineup. You know, and we'll, if we can put you in the outfield, we'll put you in the outfield. If you can play in the infield, we'll put you in the infield. But we're going to find a spot for you to be, to be in the lineup. Um, and I just, I just think it's so important for people to be able to play multiple positions. It's easier, obviously, for right-handed throwers versus lefty throwers like myself because you can either play the outfield, you can play first base, or you can catch. But outside of that, I mean, I have seen a lefty second baseman before, but those are very rare. We're speaking with Oregon State head coach Laura Berg here on In the Circle. What is it? What was it like for you? You've had you were one of the handful of people that had this perspective this year, where you had a season come to an abrupt end, so you had to deal with that with your team. But then you're also part of the U.S. Olympic team as a coaching staff, seeing the Olympics eventually get postponed a year. Those are two raw emotions there. What it, what was it like to go through those two experiences? Different, but yet. Uh, you know, you put in a lot of work in both cases there. Uh, both, obviously, <laughs> I mean, that's, it's, I mean, I mean, were you concerned at any point 
from the Olympic standpoint that that would be canceled altogether, that they wouldn't push it back a year. I mean, it, it, I can't even imagine the emotions going through that in really short period of time because that was kind of back to back. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's, it's like you just said, you know, it, it is really different, you know, with Oregon state um, you know, it's something where, you know, I talked to my players and we set up, you know, meetings with our sports psychologist and, and I wanted them to deal with the emotions. I didn't want them to sweep it under the rug. You know, uh, a lot of times we just, we push it aside and we, you know, we, we don't really deal with it as athletes, but it's really important for these guys to be able to go through the emotions, sit with it, learn from it and deal with it. And the big lesson is, you know, don't take things for granted, you know, at any point in your life. And it doesn't matter if it's just athletics or, you know, whatever it might be, it can be taken away from you in a heartbeat. You know, um, it could be, you know, somebody who's, who's, you know, important to you. It could be, you know, sports, it could be a career, it can be anything. And to really understand to, to not just go through the motions, to, to, to live every day like it's your last. And I know it sounds a little cliche-ish, but um, it, it really is true. And um, last year in March, when this got taken away, it kind of, you know, threw it in the face of, of the players. It's like, this, this really can't happen. People say it all the time, but it really can't happen. Uh, but with the Olympics, you know, that's hard. That's really hard because college athletics, it's every year. You know, the Olympics is every four years. And, you know, being with, with the players, um, you know, since 2012 and, and watching them work as hard as they work, you know, and then all of a sudden it's like, okay, first you think it's going to get canceled. And then now, thankfully, it just got pushed back a year. Um, which we're really uh, grateful for, you know, and even having this, uh, the vaccine um, will, will make it a better chance of us actually having the Olympics right. in 2021. Um, but I mean, it, it had to been so hard for those guys because you train and you, you train to a point where you certain peaks, you know, you're going to have peaks and you're going to have valleys. You're going to have peaks. And you, what you want to do is, is get yourself to that peak where when you're at the Olympics, you're hitting your peak. And, you know, then all of a sudden it kind of, throws a curveball at you. So, you know, not only are they physically strong, but you got to be mentally strong as well for things like that. Well, in the routine, right? Because when you've been in yeah. previous, in previous Olympics, you've had the tour, you've had a routine, a schedule pr to prepare for the Olympics. You know, yeah. as we, as we talk today, that's kind of up in the air. We don't know what the routine is going to be like it, when you get, you guys will get together. How many games do you get right. together or practice? That's all still to be decided. So this could be a unique situation where, you're kind of on the fly here. Thankfully, you've played together some, so that'll help. But still, it's going to be a, it's going to be a different Olympics than before, for sure, right? From a preparation standpoint. Absolutely, this is not going to be like a college tour, and then it'll be a grassroots tour, and then we go. Uh, you know, I I I don't know what it's going to look like. Um, props to to USA Softball and the people who are running that to try and figure out, you know, how, how these players are going to train and what they're going to do. And, you know, I obviously, you know, who's going to be coaching. I know Kenny is the coach, but he can't take another year off of work. So, you know, how is that, you know, who's going to be able to be with the team, you know, through from January to, right. to June, July, you know? So it's just, it's going to be absolutely different. And yeah, it, it's definitely going to be crazy. Like we were supposed to meet in December and that got canceled. So we're supposed to meet again in January, but you know, who, who knows what's going to happen right. with the holidays and this virus and you know, all of that. Sure. Did you think for a second that, man, I might not be a part of this. Cause I mean, you know, it was, it got pushed back a year, but you know, you weren't thinking that, Oh, in 2021, I gotta be, you know, you probably, you know, committed to an, an Olympics. You thought, Hey, I'd be done by now. <laughs> uh, I mean, what, what went, went through your mind on that? Cause we had coach flowers on and she said, uh -huh. you know, she thought about it for a second, man, I might be without it. But then she thought, wait, coach Berg better be a part of this or, or, or this would be really <laughs> weird. So what, what was that like yeah. going through that and, you know, knowing if, Hey, I can still be a part of this next year. I can make it happen. Yeah. This has always been, you know, a dream of mine to be a part of the, the Olympic staff and, you know, if they pushed it back, you know, I was always going to be a part of it. I, I never thought that, um, that I couldn't do it. The only thing that it's done is really push back my fly fishing game. That's all. <laughs> that's not, so. Oh, that's, that's tricky. That could be tricky. <laughs> that's going to be, it'd be a yeah. tough recovery. A, a year later on when I can learn how to do that. So. 
a year? Yeah, another year. All right. You, got, you, you could get time for that. You got time for that. <laughs> Did you reflect on your Olympic experience this summer? Because it had to be a little weird, right? Because you thought you'd be in Tokyo this summer, and you weren't. Yeah. What was that like to be there this summer, not being in the Olympics, knowing it's been pushed back a year? Did you think back to your previous Olympics, their experience, maybe appreciated more? I don't know if you had a chance to reflect on your run there. Yeah, I think um, I think every four years, whenever there's a Summer Olympic Games, it kind of you know puts me back to um, to my Olympic experiences. Uh, not this past weekend, but the weekend before, December fifth, we did a, a like a a, um, a reunion, a 1996 reunion, and someone had mentioned it would be 25 years uh, this wow. upcoming summer, or this past summer. And I was that's like, right. oh my gosh, that's it goes by so fast and just being on the call to zoom with those guys and remembering, you know, stories and things that have happened and, you know, laughing uh, with those guys. That's, it just seems like that's all we did was, was we competed and we laughed, we competed and we laughed. And uh, those, those, those women are just amazing women. And um, I just love being around them and talking to them. That's a great thing. I didn't even think about that. That would be 25 years to the first <laughs> softball Olympics in 96 in Atlanta. What, what did, what does that mean to you, being a part of that first team? I mean, that's, that's something that will be a part of your history, that you will always be a part of that first team, because then you obviously were part of the 2000 gold medal team in Sydney, the 04 team in Athens, which mm-hmm. we talked about in previous when you've been on before, about how what a huge landmark team that was historically that really mm-hmm. brought softball in the United States, you know, nationally. Uh, so just – but 96 is well where, where it all began in Atlanta. Yeah, I just, you know, feel so fortunate at being a part of that. Um, It's funny, we were talking, um, we were talking on the the reunion podcast. And, um, you know, the question was, like, how did you find out that you were on the Olympic team? Because usually back in the day that they would post it on a piece of paper down in the lobby of the hotel. And, you know, Leo, Brian Amico was my roommate at the time. And we were roommates for about, you know, 10, 12 years, uh, when we were on the national team. And, we didn't even go down there and check. Like I, I personally was like, okay, this first time I, I don't have a shot. They're going to, you know, those that have been here longer, they're going to, you know, be the ones on the team. And, you know, after that will, will be my shot. And so I didn't even go down to the check and all of a sudden Dot Richardson and Krista Williams are knocking on our door, coming in and waking Leah and myself up. And they're like, uh, you guys made the team. We're like, what? And we're so, so blessed. And, and really lucky to be a part of, uh, of the Olympics in 96 and the first ever. That's is something that's really, really very cool. That is incredible. And if I'm not mistaken, I think a couple of years ago, when you were with USA Softball in the International Cup, you were back on the field, right? Like you were at first base where they played uh, <laughs> in, in the goal. I think that's what – at least that's how TV kind of made it sound. Like, was that accurate? Do you remember that? Was that like yeah. – was that the first time you've been back since the Olympics? I mean, maybe you've been back prior to that, but what was that like to be back on that field – were you yeah, that on the goal? Um, yeah, that was the first time we, uh, I had been back on that field since wow. uh, 96. Yeah, and it wow. looked really different compared to when I went there and played. And, you know, I can, um, I took a picture in the batter's box and, you know, it just, uh, you, you just get goosebumps. You know, all of the memories kind of start flashing back of, you know, some things that happened. Like I remember, I remember it being extremely hot and then, you know, raising up different colors of flags of, you know, red is alert and black is extreme, you know, danger and drink, you know, this amount of water every hour. And it just, I remember, you know, the rain delay with Canada and I I just, there's a lot of things that really came up. That's unbelievable. That is incredible. I mean, I'm not going to say, I'm not going to ask you like to rank them, but how do you compare that to 2000, 2004? And even, even 08, Coach Erickson has talked about that having you on board because you've seen, you've, you've gone through the, both the pain of losing in a gold medal game, that that's going to be, val- that's so valuable to this current team to let them know about that disappointment. Uh, just describe those experiences. How do you, you know, car- you know how would you kind of compare them? How are they different? How are they the same? <laughs> It's, you know, I don't know if I can separate 96 and, and 2004. Um, you know, obviously 96 being the first time and playing in front of our home, you know, crowd and, you know, being loved by everybody the minute we stepped onto the field to the minute we stepped off. And uh, my parents and my twin sister being there, something that was really, you know, special and near and dear to my heart because they, they helped me um, 
they helped me get there. You know, without those guys, I'm not there. Uh, and then you have Athens where this is the, this is the home place of the Olympics. This is where it all started, you know, and then for them one to play as well as we did and to dominate the way we did to have the, the, the reef put on your head. That is just like, Oh my gosh, it's, it's, it's just, it, it gives you the chills because that's what, you know, back in the ancient days, that's what they did, you know, and it's just to be able to, to experience something like that is so special. And that 04 team, as I mentioned, like casual people caught onto your team. Like it, you were like celebrities and you, you were on the cover of Sports Illustrated and yeah. you dominate. What was that like to be a part of Sports Illustrated and that, you know, that hoopla? I mean, you were like the, the dream team was in basketball 92 Olympics in Barcelona. <laughs> I mean, it, it was a show and really put softball on the map. I know me personally, that was the first time I watched softball in depth. And that's kind of where I, I, I kind of started to follow it on a closer uh, daily basis, if you will. Mm -hmm. I, I remember um, we went to a get together. It was put on uh, um, by Sports Illustrated. And that's the, where they revealed what the uh, cover was going to look like. And I remember, you know, being up on stage and everybody just being so excited for us and us being on stage and being so excited for each other. And it just, um, I remember landing in San Francisco and seeing the magazine and you know buying some copies in the san francisco airport and you know a bunch of my friends bought copies of it and you know asked to ask for us to sign it and it, it was just something that's just so neat so very cool and just you know being a part of a team you see you know being on teams where you know one person is you know hitting on all cylinders and you can't get that person out no matter what you throw her you cannot get her out you know um in 04, everybody was like that. I mean, everybody was hitting on all cylinders. And I've never been a part of a team where, you know, not just defense, not just offense, pitching, like all three aspects of the game was happening. And hitting on all cylinders, it just was, it was just fun to sit back and watch, be a part of. Did that put some pressure on your 08 team in some ways? Because you were going to be compared to that 04 team in it. And then now if you didn't blow teams out, it's like, well, what's wrong with this team? It's kind of like what's happened with basketball in a lot of ways where if they struggled, like, you know, oh, what's wrong with them? Did that put some extra pressure on the 08 team? Because I kind of felt, remember, in 08 that you were scrutinized more because you're being compared to 04. Did you, I mean, how did you, looking back on that, how do you, do you feel that there was some added pressure maybe either internally or so forth because the expectations were so high? I don't, I don't ever remember that added pressure, you know, of that as an athlete, you always want pressure. That's why you're in athletics. Yeah. You know, you, you, you want the bat in your hand with a game winning run on second base. Um, what I remember, I remember as we were doing really well, you know, I remember, you know, kind of going through uh, the 08 tournament and, you know, breaking records and our team is, is, is doing well. We just, that last day, um, we were the best team in the tournament. We just weren't that best, the best team that day, right. you know, and, you know, we did that to Japan in 2000 where, you know, we lost to them uh, in the pool play and then we beat them, you know, in the gold medal game. They were, they were, uh, they've won all of their games until that last game. And so, and that's how it was, you know, with us as well. We beat them, we sent them to the bronze medal game and then they came back and beat us. So, you know, it's just the way the tournament uh, was designed back then, and um, they just happened to be the best team that day. Yeah, you were kind of a victim of a format that was kind of flawed in a little bit. I've never understood, like, why wasn't it just double elimination? Because that's always what softball was grown on, was double elimination. Um, I think even in the 2017, I want to say in the junior world, was that double elimination when you won in Clearwater? Did Japan have to beat you twice to win the goal, or was it a one-game no. deal? No, still one game. See, I don't understand that. Like, because you went undefeated, they had to go through a loss, and they, it, I've never understood why they didn't just do double elimination. Have you ever got an explanation on that? No. I, I, I don't know why it's done that way. Uh, like I said, though, in 2000, you know, we were we – were, um, we benefited from that. Sure. Uh, but, you know, that's just, how, that's just the way they did it. Well, partly, too, I think the perception was the U.S. was such a heavy favorite that it would be more interesting if it was just a one-game winner-take-all. But now, and you, you could probably attest to this being around it, the world has really gotten better. Like, the, oh, the comp absolutely. like this next year's Olympics 
in a lot of ways might be the greatest softball Olympics tournament ever, right? With, with respect to the previous ones, just because of the depth that there is from one to six, you can make, I mean, everybody's going to be good. It's not like it was before where there was kind of a dis a separation there. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Everyone is in for the fight of their life there because, you know, obviously we're not in for 2024, Right. We don't know if we're going to be in for 2028. And so, you know, it's, it's going to be a battle every single game. There are no games where you can take off and kind of cruise through it. Not at all. Yeah, and, and I think that's going to be fascinating and tremendous television to see how it goes. Now, one person that's going to be a part of this, this upcoming Olympics is Kat Osterman, who <laughs> dominated on Athletes Unlimited this past year, here recently. Uh, what's it like for you to see her now as someone who – played with her where she was you know coming out in college she was at texas in 04 uh, uh now here we are 16 going on 17 years later and she's now on top of her game still what what's that been like seeing you seeing her involved like she has yeah you know first you know athletes unlimited was awesome you know for for an opportunity for the players to go and kind of play in that bubble atmosphere uh was really great opportunity for all the players to be uh who are in it to be able to go there and play a game and a, a sport that they love um but with cat you know, it's just been so much fun to be able to watch um, her, you know, kind of be the baby on the team, not a baby, but, you know, being the youngest on the yeah. team. Uh, and now she is, you know, one of the oldest one on the team and leading and um, kind of, you know, using her experience to let the players kind of know what to expect, you know, one during the tour, because it, the tour is grinding. It really is, you know, you go, uh, and you play a doubleheader and then, you know, for an hour after the game, you have to sign autographs and then you get uh, media requests to have to do and you go have uh, photo shoots that you have to do. So kind of let, let the players, you know, aware of, you know, what to expect while they're on tour uh, and then uh, what to expect when you're at the Olympic Games, you know, you're going to be in a village with thousands of other athletes and some of the sports, you know, People are winning medals on day one and you have to wait till day 10 yeah. to figure out or find out, you know, what medal you win. And, you know, they're out there hooping and hollering and, and having a good time and you're trying to get your rest. And so, um, you know, those, those kind of experiences are, are, are great for the players who have never been there. And that experience that she and Monica Abbott, who was part of the 08 team, have to bring to this team, how valuable is that to have P players on the roster that have been through this, you know, you've gone through this throughout your career where you were the veteran of the Olympics each year. Like you were probably one of the go-to as far as leadership is concerned, because you knew what to expect in the Olympics, because as great as the world championships are in the Pan American games and things like that, there's a different, it's a different thing in the Olympics, isn't it? It's a different level there with the comp, you know, an emotional, because it, it's the biggest stage in the world. Absolutely. Absolutely. It only happens every four years. You know, and, and the, the Pan American Games are awesome and, and, and great in their own right, but it's only North and South America. I mean, this is the world. This is, you know, the cream of the crop from each country coming at you. And um, to be able to prepare for that and, and, and the experiences that Monica and Kat have to, to uh, bring that to their teammates and let them know what to expect is huge. It's huge. Big, big, big. And we look forward to that. Now, this summer, they were airing a lot of classic softball games uh, from the World Series, uh -huh. and your game popped up. You popped up a couple times, one in particular, your national championship, I believe, right? They showed your national title win there that year. Yeah. What, what was yeah. it like to watch you? I'm sure – I know you watched. I'm not even going to ask you if you watched it because I know you did. You were aware of it. <laughs> what was it like to watch you again, like some 20 years later, you know, revisiting that? Yeah, um, it, was, it was fun to watch. You know, I don't think I've ever watched it. Uh, until just recently, um, you know, obviously, you know, people, you know, throw clips at me of getting picked off at third base and, you know, uh, it actually worked in our favor because, you know, Nina was at a 2-2 count and ended up, ended up, you know, getting her at bat back to her and starting at a 0-0 zero -zero right. count the next game, you know, and so, you know, nobody's perfect and that's what I tell my players that, you know, even a four-time Olympian makes mistakes and, and sometimes it's in crucial crucial parts of the game and you know you learn from it and you grow and you know you can't be perfect this game will humble you and you'll never be perfect and you can only put yourself in a position to try to be perfect you won wait a minute we're, we're, we're focused on the negative there like we won 
<laughs> yeah, we did. We won. You're right. And, you know, um, a, a big part of that is, you know, Alicia Dallin and Jamie Maxey, our, our shortstop and third basemen. They did such an incredible job, it, you know, and, and Amanda Scott on the mound, uh, having to face a lineup like, like what Arizona, you know, had was, <laughs> that's impressive, you know, and she held them to, I think, three hits. And so that is extremely impressive. And Jamie and Alicia, you know, keeping their speed, uh, speedsters off the bases was huge because once those guys get on base, you know, they, they just cr create so much havoc with, you know, reading down ball and reading change up and, you know, stolen bases and things like that. It's just, you know, what those guys, the left side of the field did was, was pretty amazing. It's incredible. It's a great win. Great moment there. Uh, you sounded yeah. like Belichick there, just focusing on, you know, getting better there, which is my way of segueing into this. You're now, People may not know this since uh, we've talked about this off the air, but people may not know this on the podcast because we haven't talked about it previously. You are a diehard New England Patriots fan. Yes. Fact, for those that are watching this interview, they can see you've got a hoodie on. And, on, and you're just very Belichick look there. Look at that. You've got yeah. the Patriots yeah. jersey go. Look at this. this is, that's incredible. Yeah, you haven't cut it loud. So the first question I have to ask, how you were – Played at Fresno State. You're really West Coast girl. How did you become a Patriots fan? That's what the first question I have to ask. Well, as a kid, I thought the three-point stance on the helmet was cute, which is really weird because now, you know, looking at it, it's not cute, but it's still one of my favorite jerseys that they wear, you know, any kind of hat that, or sweatshirt that, you know, I can buy with the, with the old three-point stance on it, I'll get. Uh, but it's just ever since, you know, and it's obviously red, white, and blue. You know, Fresno State was red, white, and blue when I played. So, you know, it's the colors, too. Jumped in a good time the last couple of decades there with Brady there and company. <laughs> but now he's in Tampa Bay. So, like, what has this year been like for you, seeing him in a different uniform in Tampa Bay while you guys go with Cam Newton and have had your ups and downs? <laughs> it's it's been hard I'm uh I'll always be a Tom Brady fan you know I played with his sister at Fresno State tremendous family and uh you know um I'm always I've got the NFL package and so I watch a lot of football on Sunday um from 10 a.m till like eight o'clock at night which I love uh and so I'll make sure I'm watching you know the Bucks play and, and see how Tom is doing and um but I I've been a Patriots fan since I was a kid and it's been hard to watch um, the Patriots struggle since they've been doing so well the last 20 years, but you know, it, you can only keep up that dominance for so long. Right. But you still, you followed them pre Belichick era, right? Like oh, you, sure. yeah. How far for back sure. you go? How far back? I had a poster of, um, oh my gosh, how, why am I, how can I be blanking on his name? I had a poster. Drew Bledsoe? Do you have Bledsoe? I did. Drew Bledsoe. Yeah. And I remember it was like six pictures and it was him in his uniform, him working out, him, you know, it, I, I remember having that in my room. Um, I remember, I remember watching the Packers and the um, Patriots play in the Super Bowl yep. and uh, Brett Favre beat them. And yep. I was really pretty sad about that. Um, but yeah, I mean, I've, I've, loved them ever since <laughs> that's no that makes sense i mean that was the bill parcells led patriots there then you had the pete carroll run there oh, which yeah. is kind of wild to look back on it with the success he's had since right? at college and and even in seattle i mean that's got to yeah. make you chuckle because uh, you guys were kind of hard on him when he was there in new england because he was following <laughs> parcells if i remember as growing up there for sure yeah that's pretty and then obviously belichick comes and then you have the whole bledsoe brady drama where bledsoe gets hurt <laughs> Brady comes in and the rest as they say is history. What was that like for you? Cause you were probably a diehard Bledsoe fan, but here's this kid Brady who's kind of helping you win. And then you win that at the time was a shocking Super Bowl over the Rams. Mm -hmm. Well, and you got to go with the hot hand, you know, and yeah. obviously, you know, Belichick has, has the ins and outs of everything. He's watching practice. He's there with the guys. It's, it's just like coaching my team here. I see them day in and day out. Who's putting the hard work in, who isn't, who's got the hot hand. And that's what you got to go with. You know, your job at the end of the day is to put the people on the field who are going to win ball games. And obviously he made the right choice. I can sense that. You've kind of taken some things that he's done. Maybe, you know, if, uh, outfit aside, uh, there's some things you've known. You, you, and I'm wondering, as a fellow coach, 
there's things. Do you pick out some things when you're watching him coach, maybe his demeanor, how he treats or how he handles certain things, or maybe even other coaches you've seen other sports that you kind of pick some things they do and, Hey, I could do that too, to help, you know, my, in, you know, my coaching the philosophy mm -hmm. and things like that. Yeah. I think what's, uh, what's so great uh, about Belichick is that he doesn't, he doesn't have favorites. You know, you could be the franchise player. And if you have your head up your butt and you're not playing well, he's going to call you out um, for those mistakes. And uh, I did try one thing where, you know, how Belichick likes to take away their star athlete, their star uh, key player, whether it's wide receiver or running back or whoever, uh, whoever you might be. Um, you know, I've tried to uh, use that with my team of, look, you know, you, you knock this pitcher out, this is their star pitcher, then it's going to be downhill for them. And so attack, attack, attack this pitcher, attacker. And uh, sometimes it's worked and sometimes it hasn't. So. Well, your team, like we, we, we talked earlier about the versatility that you have on your roster. Well, Belichick, in a lot of ways, that's what he's known for is the versatility. Like one week, they'll show you one look. The next week, they'll give you a completely different look. And I feel like in softball, you're kind of doing that as well with some of the different looks you have, potentially either with a lineup or pitching moves with playing multiple uh, positions, which he's had to do as well in the NFL at times with guys that have played cornerback and receiver, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Oh, for sure. You know, and, and, you know, you get a little guy like uh, Edelman who, you know, is just a warrior and a leader and he just brings it to the field every day. And, you know, you try and get your players to kind of emulate somebody who's like that. So is the NFL like your favorite, like other than softball, is that your favorite sport to watch? Is that like your biggest Patriots is like kind of your go-to there? Or do you have other teams you follow in sports here? I, I, um, yeah, I love watching football. I love, um, you know, I, I will watch baseball, um, postseason baseball is what I like. Um, I, I like the Yankees, which is totally weird. I know, I know, because it's New York and Boston, I get it. Um, but I like the old school Yankees, you know, um, obviously Jeter, um, Mickey Mantle, you know, Yogi Berra, you know. You know you're into the history. Kind of yeah, you're into the history. Yeah, yeah. So, and it's, it's like individual, you know, um, tight players more in baseball like it is a obsession for the Patriots um for baseball you know I like the Yankees um I'm always you know checking to see if they won and all that but it's a, a lot has to do with like individual type players um the second baseman for for the Houston Astros uh the center fielder for uh the Angels you know um great players and you know I, I love to watch and um you know see how they're doing in your Olympics experience, was there an athlete you got to meet that you were like, wow, that was awesome. I got to meet or somebody you wish you would have met that you didn't get to in the Olympics? Because obviously you're all, I don't know how the Olympics, you could probably describe it better, what the Olympic atmosphere is like. Because I think you're all in the similar villages sometimes, aren't you? Like all the athletes? Yeah, yeah. we are. Um, you know, I got, got to meet like Monica Seles. Um, I think, uh, as you could tell from my profile pic on Facebook, uh, the picture with, you know, Kobe Bryant, mm. um, you know, obviously now means something uh, sure. a lot more special, you know, than when I took it, um, you know, gosh, LeBron James, I got to take a picture with LeBron James. Um, who else? I'm, I'm just blanking on, a, on I've, I've been able was, to meet. Yeah. You were part of the redeem team there. That was the U S yeah. redeem team that they got the gold back there with LeBron, Dwayne Wade, all those yeah. guys. Yeah. That's pretty wild. That's pretty good. That's a pretty good life side there. there. Yeah. The great thing. In, well, here's what happened in 04 is, so we had the opening ceremonies and then the next day was ours, was our first, first game. And so um, the way opening ceremonies happens, obviously it's late and then you don't get back until two, three o'clock in the morning. And so we, as a team opted out of not going to the opening ceremonies. Wow. But the, the village in where we are staying, that's where all the athletes were getting sure. together to be able to go leave. And so we got to see, you know, the men's basketball team, the women's basketball team, uh, Martina Navatilova, we got to take a picture with her and meet her and um, just all, you know, all of the, the gymnasts and, and, and everybody that you see, that you read about. That's pretty cool. Was Phelps, Michael Phelps, part of the, uh, one of the old Olympics in 08? Was he part of that? Yeah. Was in the, that was when he dominated, right? Yeah. Do you, are you aware of that when that's going on, that somebody else is like dominating their specific sport like Phelps was with swimming or oh, yeah. Usain Bolt? Yeah. Yeah, um, we have TVs, you know, in our, in the the buildings that we're in, and I remember sleeping, and I can in in hearing my teammates just 
screaming for him. And I think it was that one where he barely, he did that extra thrust and he was able to barely beat his opponent to be able to win gold. And I can remember hearing my teammates screaming uh, to encourage him because of course he can hear while, you know, you know, TV. Absolutely. We all do. That's why we <laughs> scream at him. We're, that's what we tell ourselves every time. That's a pretty ex ex experience yeah. there. Now, lately screaming at Josh McDaniels. So um, <laughs> I don't, I can't hear me. So. Yeah. Okay. So like, okay. So yeah. I, all right. So how frustrating has, has it been frustrating? You've mentioned, so you watch, Bra you're, you're kind of like many Patriots fans. You watch Brady's games, but you're also watching the Patriots because the television ratings have said that in Boston and mm -hmm. et cetera. Uh, so like, are you disappointed with this season? Do you understand it? Is it rebuilding? I mean, we're obviously our teams are playing this week. So, and you've dominated yeah. us for 20 years. So this is, this is the reason why I brought you on really. Cause finally after two decades, I have the upper hand here. I hope. As a Dolphin fan, uh, no, for those that don't know. It, yeah, it's been frustrating. You know, um, I, I would think, you know, obviously I don't know much about football and, you know, I don't coach in the National League and um, and it's easy to Monday night quarterback, but everybody and their mother knows that Cam's going to run the ball when he gets close to the goal line. Yeah. So, you know, that stop against, you know, Seattle Seahawks, yeah. it's like, come on you know, the, the bills and we lose it on a fumble and it just, there's been the Rams, the fourth down and everybody knows Cam's going to run it. So why not, you know, do something a little different, you know, keep them on their toes a little bit. But, you know, like I said, I'm not, a, I'm not a football, I'm just a fan, a uh, football coach. I'm just a fan. And, you know, sometimes it gets frustrating to watch. You're two plays away from being in the playoffs, really. I mean, you mentioned the Seattle yeah. stopped on fourth and goal. And then the fumble as he was driving against Buffalo. It's, I mean, that's how the NFL is, though. It's that close. It's kind of like softball in the Pac-12, right? One pitch, one play really can make that big of a difference. Um, and now, you know, if, does it make you at least, you know, chuckle that the Dolphins have, like, a Patriot, a Belichick a clone there and Brian Flores? Brian, I, Brian Flores, yep, yep. Uh, so I was going to give you crap about and just, just remind you. You got a, a product of Belichick down there, so. I'm just glad he's a successful one. As you know, he's had some others that haven't panned out. So he seems to be the, the right choice. And yeah, they're yeah. kind of they're kind of eerily similar because the yeah. Dolphins have a lot of injuries right now, as you know, and they've had to play guys. Or you're like, who is this guy? Where did he come from? Like the running backs. They, yeah. They've been playing the fourth stringers and fifth stringers, kind of like what New England's done for years, where you're like, where do these guys come from? They're not big names. Mm -hmm. Casual fans can't name them if they don't follow him closely, but yet they're successful and they believe it and they buy it in. And he's kind of helped rebuild the Dolphin team. Yeah. I will say, uh, we'll take some credit. We kind of ended the Brady dynasty there last year when they beat him. Because <laughs> you would have had the bye if you would have yeah. beaten us that week last yeah, week. Yeah, we would have had the bye. Yeah. Did, yeah. You know, did you know it was over? Did you think he would always come back? What, what was your mindset as a fan? I thought he was going to come back. Okay. I really did. I was like, you know, he's just, he's a patriot for life and, you know, I just, it would be so hard to see him in a different uniform. Um, but, you know, obviously he's got to do what's best for him and his family. And, you know, and that's the decision that he made. And so it is what it is. And I'm happy he's playing, he's playing well. And I listened to First Take a lot and Max Kellerman. And I just, you know, want to shoot him a message and be like, you know, I hope, how's that crow tasting? You know, there you go. Home. I like it. So you're rooting for him. You're not going to hold it. You know, if he does well, you're fine with it. Because some oh, fans, sure. okay, okay, okay. For sure, I want him to be very successful. But you want yeah. not at the Patriots' expense. You want. I just, I just don't want them beating the Patriots when they play. I think they play uh, next year. They're on our yes. schedule. Yes, in New England, I believe, too. Oh, I may have could... to go to that game, depending on when it is. I have a feeling a few people might. That could be a lot. <laughs> in, the, in the meantime, our teams are going to play this Sunday night, Dolphins, Patriots. Can you just go – can you, like, not show up like you did against the Rams? That's my request. No, well, with the way the track history is, is we never really played well in Miami. And so you don't have to worry about that. So I'm, I'm pretty sure that's what, what will happen. I hope you're right. I hope you're right. I hope I better not be getting – I better not be getting text. I, I better not get text messages from you like during the game. And hey, how's it going? Because that's a bad sign. Well, you know, I usually do my trash talking after the game. After we have won, I don't really do that during the game. Yeah. Uh, I never have. You know. Uh, well, I've given you plenty of ammunition now. Like if this is good, because <laughs> our team is banged up. Knowing you, and knowing Belichick, yeah. they'll play their best game of the year and just ruin our playoff chances. No, again, it's in it's in South Beach, and so I just I don't I we just <laughs> we have never played well there. That's one of the reasons why you don't like Florida in general. It's just those, those losses in Miami just kind of adds up. Florida, you've got man-eating snakes, you've got alligators, you have hurricanes, you have humidity. 
um, you have crazy people and bugs. So yeah, I mean, that's like six right out there off the top of my head. Now, I have to, we'll have to talk back, get you back on and kind of go over some of those things. The good news is you don't have to worry about the Super Bowl in Tampa this year with the Patriots. So look, look at that. that. That's a positive thing. You're right. You're right. You know, it's a good year so, to rebuild. If somebody beats the Chiefs, you know, I'm good. I don't care. <laughs> somebody beats the Chiefs. That's yeah. going to be hard. That, I mean, I don't, I'm not even going to say that our team has any chance against them. So, uh, I, I mean, you guys played them tough last weekend. We did. So we, we did. How the heck? How, okay. Here's my question is how does yep. it you have three interceptions and you don't beat them? Did you see who our receivers were at that point? Like, could you name them? We were banged up. Like I told you, we had our four string backs. Kyle Benoit was out at linebacker. Like, yeah, he's a Patriot by the way. Yeah. We took yeah. a couple of your guys. We're, you did. You did. Look, if we can't beat them, we try to grab some of them. That's kind of <laughs> in our philosophy. Look at it that way. So, you know, hopefully we play well, hopefully it'll be a good game Sunday. And yeah, uh, it'll be a fun game. It. And then yeah. hopefully soon enough, we'll see you on the field with your team in the spring. Uh, that'll yeah. be my last question here. What's going to be the keys for your team to accomplish your goals once you get to the season? I know there's a lot of, you know, the uncertainties with the schedules and things. Those mm -hmm. things you can't control. But as far as what you can control, what's going to be the keys? Well, the biggest thing is one, be flexible. You've got to be flexible. You know, we could, you know, one day say we're playing on a Friday and then all of a sudden we're not playing. Um, you know, or, you know, you're going to play a double header on Friday when you were scheduled to only have one game. And so one to be flexible and two is going to be, have to be to execute, you know, uh, we've got a runner at first base and we got to get them to second base and be able to hit them in. Um, we have to be able to keep our errors to a minimum. You know, we've had, uh, too many errors in the past. And so we've got to take care of that issue. And then obviously pitching it, 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 uh, the ball really does start in the circle. And so we got to be able to, uh, throw ground balls, you know, and get people to just miss. Well, we look forward to seeing that soon. And uh, we, we will wish you well, except this Sunday. That's when we will not wish you well. <laughs> okay. That's head coach Lower Berg. We're now, right now, for those watching, we're just showcasing our favorite team's colors. That's how diehards we are. Appreciate you being a good sport about it. Uh, have fun. Uh, it's always great to have you on. And uh, we wish you well here. We had uh, look to have you see you again in 2021 there and beyond and talk to you down the road.